let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to our second um, consecutive Lunch and Learn um, today, Wednesday, July 15th. I'm really excited about today's Lunch and Learn. Um, I, with the presenters, we did a dry run on Monday, and I really think that it's going to be something beneficial for everybody. Um, so I wanted to introduce them. Um, today we have Alyssa. So Alyssa is um, going to be a senior at Purdue. Her plan is to attend medical school and pursue an MD, PhD, and eventually become a computational biologist and clinician studying and treating pa pediatric cancer. Um, she actually just got her MCAT scores back today and she said that she's excited. So that seems like it's good news. Um, she's worked at the R&D group off and on since she was in high school. Um, but this summer, primarily, she's worked on quality management, debugging, and application usability. And then we have Claire. Claire is our um, graduate, so congratulations on that. She received a degree in human physiology and a minor in Spanish while playing D1 soccer for the Hawkeyes at the University of Iowa and working at the same time in a cardiovascular genetics research lab. Um, she's going to be attending New York University Grossman School of Medicine in the fall, um, which seems like it's going to be virtual at first. Um, but in the meantime, she says she's taking a short break from science, working here with us at the R&D group, although I'm not sure what a, that that's a full break from science. Um, she's primarily been working on the QMS system and software requirement tracking with Kathy. So with Without further ado, um, we are going to be talking about medical terminology as it relates to R&D group. So I'm going to give the floor to Alyssa. I'll actually probably start us off here on this slide. Oh, sorry. Um, no problem. Thank you. Um, so we're just kind of going to start with some basic genetics and foundational terms that we're going to build on as we move forward to discuss the different experiments, methods of analysis, um, things that R&D clients might be using to take advantage of these basic biological molecules. So to start with DNA, pretty straightforward. It's a double strand molecule that contains the combination of four nucleotides that it codes for RNA and protein. More specifically, what is a nucleotide? It is a molecule composed of a phosphate sugar backbone with a nitrogenous base. The difference between the four nucleotides occurs at this level of the base. Um, Alyssa is going to touch on those bases here shortly. Um, DNA, straight up, straight up, pretty much simply is the blueprint for who you are, how your body functions, how you respond to different environmental factors, things of that nature. RNA, pretty similar. Um, it's a single strand molecule that ha has four nucleotides again. Um, it has many different functions, but the primary and most relevant for you, you all is likely that it is the bridge between DNA and protein. You'll often hear it called mRNA, which is um, short for messenger RNA. So like I said, very similar to DNA, aside from it being single-stranded, and it has a slightly different sugar in the backbone. That's where you get the R instead of the D, and then it has one different um, base. Protein is the functional product of DNA transcription and translation. Uh, proteins come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, they can come as enzymes that catalyze reactions, hormones that enact change in a distant location in your body, or it can be carriers in the blood that facilitate molecule transport, or it can be actual transporters on the cell membrane that allow molecules either to cross the cell membrane or initiate a signal transduction pathway. Um, so your protein output from your DNA is the foundation for pretty much all your specific characteristics. This is just pretty much a depiction of the flow of information from DNA to RNA to protein. Um, it's, it's called the central dogma. It's where DNA is going to be transcribed using a variety of enzymes, and then RNA is going to be translated also using a slew of enzymes to create your protein, which is your, as I said, end product. This is a very simplified uh, depiction as the process requires the use of so many enzymes and steps. Um, many laboratory techniques and many of R&D's clients likely take advantage of these enzymes and use them um, in their different experiments and analysis. Most common and one that we will talk about a little bit later is a polymerase, which is an enzyme that basically just catalyzes the formation of a polymer. In this case, it's going to be DNA or RNA. I want to make a little point about this like red asterisk over here, the reverse transcription. That'll come up um, a little bit later talking about how you can go um, in, you can go in between both DNA and RNA um, 
using manipulating with the, these enzymes. And before we move to the next slide, I just want to let you guys know um, the girls are uh, ready for questions at the end of each slide. If you do have them, if not, we will answer them at the end. All right, so a gene is a section of DNA that helps make you who you are. Um, as Claire mentioned, they are comprised of a specific pattern of these A, T, C, and G nucleotides. And through their protein products, um, which have specific functions like turning on other genes or performing a reaction in the cell, you can have certain characteristics like hair color or how well you metabolize food. It is also worth mentioning that environmental factors can play a role in the development of these characteristics as well. A mutation is when one of the nucleotides is switched to a different one, such as A to C. And this can happen during DNA replication or transcription. When a gene accumulates several of these mutations, uh, that can lead to diseases such as cancer. And you may have heard of sickle cell anemia, which is actually the result of just one nucleotide mutation. So these are just some basic terms in regards to sample preparation, which may be necessary for the lab experiments that Claire will talk about. So first, centrifugation is when a sample is spun at, at extremely high speeds and it is used to separate the sample into its different components on the basis of size and density. Gel electrophoresis is when DNA is put into slots in a gel material with holes and pores similar to a sponge. An electric current is run through the apparatus, which pulls the samples through, and since small DNA can navigate the pores easier, then longer DNA, this smaller DNA travels faster, and thus the samples are separated by size. Pipetting can obtain liquids as small as two microliters up to as large as 25 milliliters. Vortexing is when a sample is spun and shaken at high speeds in order to mix the sample and distribute its components evenly. And then there's lysing, which is when a cell is broken open through several different possible mechanisms in order to obtain the inner contents, such as the cell's protein and or DNA. And then extraction can mean a few different things in science, but for most cases in the R&D group, it is likely referring to a process by which you can get DNA, RNA, or protein from cells. This usually includes several steps like lysis, centrifugation, precipitation, binding, and washing. Reagents can include buffers, which stabilize pH, dyes, acids and bases, enzyme solutions, which catalyze reactions, and reactants for starting a chemical reaction. So now moving to a little bit more of the experimental or the, or sorry, the experiments or the analysis. Um, so we have polymerase chain reaction, PCR, something I'm sure all of you have at least heard of or are familiar with. So the basic goal is to amplify a desired DNA target for manipulation or analysis. Uh, typically, manipulation would confer um, mutagenizing a target to determine how it affects a protein product. Uh, but for your purposes, I'm assuming that the analysis is the more heavily used um, application. So this photo here is going to show you the kind of the basic steps. Um, of a PCR. You see on the left hand side of the screen you have that template DNA that you um, extracted using the sample preparation steps that were just mentioned. Um, so you're going to start with that DNA sample and um, if you know the sequence, which assuming if you're starting doing a PCR you're going to know the sequence, you're going to design primers that are single stranded um, that are going to bind to that target sequence that you're looking for. So you will put that DNA sample, those single stranded primers, that polymerase enzyme and free nucleotides into a tube um, and then you're going to place that tube in a thermocycler or in the case of let's say pneumotics everything kind of happens in the um, machine and then it gets placed onto that PCR plate. The machine is going to cycle through temperatures um, once that tube is in the PCR plate in order to denature the DNA into single strands which opens it up for those single stranded primers to bind. Once those primers bind, um, the polymerase is going to come in and then bind to that DNA primer complex and do what it does, and that's just creating more and more polymers, which basically just creates uh, multiple copies of that target DNA. So with each subsequent cycle, the DNA is doubled. So you can see here on the right-hand side of the 
screen after 30 cycles you have 10 to the ninth copies of your um, target DNA sequence if you just started with those two template strands or those that, that one strand that had the double stranded um, template DNA. Does anyone have any questions so far? Um, yeah, just kind of a clarifying thing because it's always kind of been a mystery and uh, I've been aware that uh, in these uh, processes that, that we're making copies of DNA and it's, I've always been fascinated. How does that happen? Because it seems like you only got so much of the stuff. So I take it the, I guess the additional chemistry comes from the primers and, mm -hmm. and that's, that's where the copies come from? So, well, so you have, let's say you have, what you, what you do is you design a forward primer and a reverse primer that kind of um, sandwich the region of interest or the target region, and they will bind to the single-stranded DNA and the polymerase itself, because there's free nucleotides and buffers in the solution, will pull those free nucleotides and create a brand new strand. So once you have that new strand in the next time you cycle through, you have that new strand plus your template strand um, to start with for those primers to then bind and then create new strands, new strands, um, and new strands further. Does that answer that? So the free nucleotides kind of um, in the solution are what give you the new section of DNA. Um, right, yeah, and that's, that's kind of something I've always, always wondered about. And in this process, are there ever any concerns about copy errors where the new strands aren't maybe quite what the original was or is that just not possible? Oh yeah, that's absolutely um, a problem that I have run into in my time um, in the lab that I was in. You can use like, uh, there's different sorts of polymerases um, that are harvested. There's some that you harvest from, I believe it's an organism, the bottom of the ocean and you har harvest that polymerase, it's called a TAC polymerase. Um, and that's got a decent fidelity, but you can harvest um, even higher fidelity polymerases that are less likely to have copier errors, but it's absolutely um, likely that you could have a single nucleotide switch or things like that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? In, yeah, in your graph in the first cycle, you have the little short green piece with the slash like the, mm -hmm. in the second column kind of. Is that the primer then? Yeah. Yeah, and so then, the re then like in the next column over, it shows it completely filled out. That just mm -hmm. gets filled out by copying the the blue section. Yep, yep. That's the that's the the work of the polymerase is is creating that rest of that green section, copying the blue. And how long are the primers? Um, so typically, so like they they get um, more expensive the larger you make them. Typically, if you're just doing a kind of a um, a basic PCR, they're going to be about 20 base pairs, 20 to 30 base pairs long. And they can make them from just a formula? Like if you say I need a an ATG, ATG, there's one available to be purchased? So yeah, so there's um, the, the company that I'm most familiar with, and I'm sure there are companies all around, but it's called um, IDT, uh, Integrated Integrative DNA technologies, I want to say, um, and what you do is you get on there and you type in the sequence that you want, and because we know the chemistry of the nucleotide, that it's got that phosphate um, sugar backbone with the nitrogenous base, you can um, you can synthesize the primers to be um, any sort of pattern of nucleotides that you want. And then does the gray part get chopped off, or is it just like that you have a copy of the a whole copy of the section you're looking for? So polymerases typically fall off. So if you put them on the primer and then they run, they typically fall off around uh, 200 base pairs. So that gray part, let's say that's just um, meant to depict the rest of the DNA or the rest of um, the section that you're amplifying, but that's, that's outside of that like 200 base pair region that you're not super interested in. Um, it's going to fall off pretty much, and then by the end, it's going to be very specific to the region that you um, sandwiched those primers between or outside of. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, can I say something here? Um, so for any gene, you normally have um, trailing, starting with AAA and ending with TTT. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about A T G C, A always uh, A always bond with T and G always bond with C. That's how uh, you know we replicate. 
So we have a uh, we have a liquid solution with which has loose A, T, G, and C. Now you have a template where you know, you know, let's say A, T, G, C, C, G. But when you have that liquid solution with, uh, you know, free A, T, G, C, it will just bind. Like all the A will bind with the T, all the G will bind with the C. So that's how it synthesizes the second stand, that green stand. Chris, does that make sense? Yeah, I get that same. Okay. So I've got a question. Um, how specific are the primers? Let's say what you're looking for has a mutation. Mm -hmm. so it has, let's just say, one mutation. Will the primer still bind to it? Or do you have to make multiple primers with multiple mutations to bind? So, so, so is the question that you're you're looking to see presence or absence of a mutation, or well, wanna... like viruses that have mutated? Like, mm -hmm. can you make something that will bind to multiple different? versions of the virus or do you have to version the primer um yeah so a lot of different let's say viruses if that's what we're talking about they're going to have um regions that are highly conserved across any different um diff uh, different isoform or different version of a virus so there's going to be regions that are super specific to the virus but also super highly conserved across that family of viruses. So if you're looking for a virus, even if you're looking for one variant or the other, you're going to probably want to design primers for the region of the, the highest um, conservation. Um, and then the variations can just kind of be downstream from the primers. And if they're as long as the primer is able to bind that region of conservation, it will um, amplify in between those sandwiched areas. By conservation, you mean that they're just they're stable? Yeah, so like there are sections of DNA that are um, necessary for life. Like I think that all humans share like 98% of DNA because there are regions that are absolutely necessary for you and me to live. And, and those are considered like highly conserved areas. And then the variation occurs um, at, at about 2% of the rest of our DNA. So, so the primer needs to be uh, specific enough to what you're trying to do but a part of it that it's stable stable yes. but unique to that thing that you're trying to detect yep so um you can you can design a primer with that mutation if you're looking for the difference like if you're trying to determine if someone does have a specific variant you can design a primer with the variant which would maybe require you to change out a few nucleotides um, but otherwise, if you're just looking for presence or absence of the virus, you're going to go with the, the DNA in the virus that is typically um, and that basically perpetuates across all different forms. So how do they know which sections to pick for the primers? Um, that is a good question. There are. Um, I think that so if you're it kind of depends on what your application is. Um, like if you're genotyping, you and you're meaning you're trying to determine. Okay, so let's think about so I can explain it in, in terms of like a mouse model. So you try to put in a, a genetic mutation into a mouse model. You're going to design the primer for the the protein or not the protein, but the DNA product that creates the protein um, that you're that you're trying to mutate. Um, so it's, it, I mean, it's, it's up to the, the experimenter and the designer on what, um, where they want to put the primer. Um, in the case of the viruses, they would look for just, a, they would just do sequencing on the entire genome of the virus, and then they would likely find the conserved regions and then design the primer from there. Um, but there's different application, different applications that are going to, um, require different primer design. I don't know if Alyssa can jump in here at all yeah with... um i've had some experience designing a primer um so what we did in one of my uh classes one of my labs um we were given this sequence um we were studying 
a leukemia and we were given this sequence of a gene that we wanted to look at and um, so you we designed the primer looking at uh, the beginning part of the gene and you want it to be long enough that it'll be stable um, and then also GC bonds so the nucleotides G and C have a little bit stronger bonds than A and T so we um, look to have a certain proportion of GC bonds compared to A AT so that the primer would bind to the DNA stronger. Um, and then there was also a part that we looked at for uh, thermal stability that we took into account as well. So um, we kind of tried to balance how much of the gene we wanted the primer to match with uh, to optimize its thermal stability and its um, binding strength. Does that Do make sense? To, yeah. Do you have to run it like through a database to make sure it doesn't match other genes, other like viruses, or like, do you have to take a probe and say, is this specific enough? Um, we did use a database. I'm not sure. That's a good question. I'm not sure if it looks at whether it would match other genes. I would have to look into that. Claire, do you know? Um, if, your, if your primer is about 20 to 30 bases um, long and you have extracted the DNA um, to the point of you're confident that you have what you think you have in the sample, like let's say you're like, okay, I have the DNA from um, the mouse in this sample and there's nothing else, then the 30, 20 to 30 uh, length, sorry, 20 to 30 base pair length primer is typically going to be specific enough just because of um, how uh, unlikely it would be for tw uh, you know, 20 to 30 nucleotides side, but like the likelihood of that happening and having the exact same sequence as somewhere else is, um, is low. I'm sure it's possible. That is a good question. But once you've extracted and you have the, the um, actual template DNA or you have the actual RNA of extracted and um, isolated in solution, you can typically typically be confident with a with a stable and long enough primer that you are going to be um, targeting where you want to be targeting. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to have to move on so we can get the rest of the questions at the end. So um, sticking on with PCR, um, there are two types of PCRs. There is a qualitative or quantitative PCR. Um, your qualitative is going to amplify and determine the presence or absence of a specific target or pathogen, kind of like what we were just talking about. Um, and the products can be visualized by gel electrophoresis, uh, as Alyssa described, or different methods of um, fluorescence, which is a little bit, I think, more relevant to you guys. I think that it sounds like the whole logic machine uses um, intercalating dyes or fluorescent probes, which intercalating dyes just means it gets in between the hydrogen bonds of DNA um, and then just when exposed to light, it will glow. So there are so it's those options, intercalating dyes are the um, oligonucleotides that have that bind downstream from the primer that fluoresce as well once exposed to light. Um, the common applications of qualitative PCR is genotyping, cloning, paternity testing, forensics, pathogen detection, um, all of those things. So quantitative PCR, which you'll commonly hear referred to as qPCR, um, with, has the goal of amplifying a specific target to determine the relative concentration of DNA present at the start of the reaction. Um, this, I'm going to jump down to common applications. This would be relevant to determining if a target gene is overexpressed in any tissue. Let's say it's uh, more highly expressed in the heart versus the brain or the heart versus the liver. You can determine that with the qPCR or you can determine if a mutation is going to cause a change in gene expression within one tissue. These products are primarily visualized by fluorescence, um, either those intercalating dyes or probes. Um, I want to note that you guys might also sometimes hear RT-qPCR or RT-PCR, which um, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but basically that is where you start with RNA and you reverse transcribe. Um, if you can think back to that earlier central dogma slide, um, 
you can reverse transcribe. So go from that, go from that RNA to that DNA. Um, it's what is called cDNA, and then you can run the PCR, the qPCR. And then also you'll hear real-time PCR or real-time qPCR, which kind of gets confusing with the reverse transcription being also RT. But this is um, just going to occur when the machine is actively reading the fluorescent signals during the PCR, and it's going to produce an output um, with preliminary information that you can uh, get a read on. Um, another thing that we discussed at that Lunch and Learn a few weeks ago is the transcription-mediated amplification, known as TMA. So um, pretty basically, it's the isothermal amplification of RNA. The goal of this is very similar to that of PCR. Um, you're going to be amplifying a nucleotide sequence to detect the presence or absence of a pathogen. But this time, you get to start with RNA because it's very common that viruses have R um, RNA as their genetic material rather than DNA. Um, it's a single tube reaction. It's a little bit more efficient and effective. It has so it runs at a constant temperature and it uses three important enzymes, reverse transcriptase, RNA polymerase, and RNase H. In the case of Hologic, the panther does not use, or I believe it's the panther, does not use RNase H, they just use reverse transcriptase. But basically the steps are um, to, if you look over here at the, the image on the right, you basically create a DNA strand, then you create a double strand of DNA, and then the RNA polymerase is going to hop on and create multiple amplicons of RNA, kind of like what it does when going from DNA to RNA for protein transcription. Um, but the, um, like I said, it's a pretty efficient and effective process. So, and then another thing that we wanted to touch on is the different types of sequencing that are available right now. Um, so. To start, each of us has approximately 3 billion base pairs in your entire genome, um, but the coding portion of the genome or the section or the number of bases that directly transcribes or translates into protein is only about 30 million. So that's only 1% of our entire genome. Um, so you can guess there's still stuff to be discovered, but as far as sequencing goes, exomic sequencing is just going to be sequencing that portion that directly codes for protein. Um, the pros, this is, as I said, if it's only 1% of your genome, it's significantly less data to sort through. And the thought process is, if you have a mutation affecting a protein output, it's likely going to be in the code for the protein. So it's likely going to be within the exome, which is, which is what they dub the um, section of your genome that is protein coding exome. Cons, um, there's still a lot of stuff we don't know, and there's limited detection of certain types of mutations. There's limited representation of structural variants. If there's shifts within the genome, you can't pick that up with exomic sequencing. So to contrast, you have genomic sequencing, which is going to sequence the entirety of an individual's DNA at a single time. So this will be able to detect structural variants, other mutations, um, but the cons are that it's an extremely large data set to sort through, and you're going to be left with a lot of data that you might not know what it means or its implications. So that those are the cons. Um, I think it's important to note that also there's this term you'll hear, next gen or next generation sequencing, NGS. So that just basically refers to the new methods that allow for an entire genome to be sequenced in one day, because previously using only the Sanger sequencing methods took scientists years, I think a decade, to sequence a single human genome. Um, so next gen sequencing is going to sequence in parallel the genome, many sections of the genome in parallel, so it gets done much quicker. Um, I know that R&D wrote a uh, bioinformatics software for genomic data obtained through um, NGS um, for Archer DX using an Illumina sequencer. All right, so a little bit more basics. This is a cell. Uh, a cell is the basic structural, functional, and biological unit of all known organisms. It contains many different organelles, which are these structural units with different functions, and these include the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the ribosome. And the nucleus is also an organelle, and it contains the DNA for the cell. Um, some cells that you can find in a human are red blood cells, epithelial cells, which line our intestines and make up our skin, as well as muscle cells. 
So float cytometry is a laboratory method used to detect, identify, and count specific cells. This method can also identify particular components within the cell. And this information is based on physical characteristics and or markers called antigens on the cell surface or within cells that are unique to that cell type. This method may be used to evaluate cells from blood, such as with the beckman coulter Avenger sample prep machine, as well as bone marrow body fluids, such as cerebrospinal fluid or tumors. So the steps for flow cytometry are that first, a, cell is, a, a sample of cells is suspended in a fluid, and then prior to testing, depending on the cells being analyzed, the sample may be treated with special dyes to further define cell subtypes. And these dyes, or fluorochromes as they may be called, um, that are used are attached to antibodies that bind to particular cells or key components of the cell. And then the sample containing the cells passes through the instrument, which is called a flow cytometer. In the instrument, the fluid in which the cells are pa suspended passes through very narrow channels so that the cells are organized in a single file as they pass the detectors. This is accomplished at a high rate of speed from hundreds to thousands of cells per second. And the flow cytometer contains one or more lasers and a series of photodetectors that are able to ident identify certain characteristics unique to various cell types. The single cell suspension creates unique light scattering events that occur when each cell passes through the laser light. These initial events are characteristic of the size and shape of the cell, as well as the intensity of the signal that is generated by the specific dyes, thus creating patterns that reflect cell type. The signals from the detectors are amplified and sent to a computer where they are converted to a digital readouts um, that can be displayed on the computer screen or in a printout. Uh, the data are usually displayed as graphs, and then scientists can then analyze those graphs and determine the composition of the original sample. So um, we're going to talk a little bit also about electroporation and transfection. So let's say that you have used PCR to generate a mutation and you want to see what that mutation does to a cell or its protein output. So you're going to want to put that DNA into the cell. So pretty generally, transfection is just going to be the process of introducing a foreign nucleic acid sequence to the cell, um, as I said, to kind of determine the um, how overexpressing a specific gene or target sequence is going to affect it. Um, but electroporation more specifically is a method, one of di many different methods that labs can use to get the DNA into the cell. Um, Maxite machine, I believe, conducts this um, electroporation um, uh, method. So if it works, it is very useful. However, it is known to cause a fair amount of cell death um, just because it's um, exposing a cell to a uh, transient cell dis destabilization via an electric field. So um, it's likely to cause some cell death, but if it works, it is very useful in getting the DNA into the cell. So then we also wanted to cover viruses and bacteria, um, as we found that a lot of the clients R&D works for test for diseases caused by viruses or bacteria. So first, viruses are microscopic infectious agents that require living hosts to survive, meaning they are parasitic. They consist of an outer protein coat or capsid surrounding the inner genomic material, which can be DNA or RNA. Some viruses, including coronavirus and the flu, have an envelope containing all of this material, which is made from the last cell the virus infected. Viruses work by attaching to or penetrating a host cell and then injecting its genomic material inside. Using the host cells or the virus's machinery, the viral genomic material is repeatedly replicated and then encapsulated until eventually the host cell lyses and the viral offspring are free to infect other cells. Viral diseases are treated with antiviral medications and vaccines, which either inhibit replication of the virus or train the body's immune system to recognize and fight the virus, respectively. Bacteria are a type of cell, but they are different from most of the cells you would find in a human or an animal 
because they don't have organelles or a nucleus, but they do have a cell wall along with a cell membrane. Bacteria can be beneficial or detrimental to human health. For example, there are many species of bacteria in our gut that help us digest food. On the other hand, there are bacteria that cause disease, like E. coli and Streptococcus. Bacterial infections are treated with antibiotics, which work by attacking the cell wall, interfering with bacterial reproduction, or blocking protein production. Antibiotics do not work on viruses because of their structural differences. So then we also wanted to do a case study to um, sort of wrap up all the terms we've learned and give a summary. Um, so we chose COVID-19. So to begin with, what is COVID-19 or coronavirus? Well, it is a virus, and in this case, it contains RNA inside of its protein coat. It is named coronavirus because corona means crown, and scientists noticed what appeared to be a crown of protein spikes around the virus when they analyzed it under a microscope. Because it is a virus, it requires a host to survive, although we can probably remember the vast speculation as to how long it could survive on different materials like Amazon boxes or metal surfaces before infecting another host. The initial host of this coronavirus is believed to be a bat, but the virus's RNA mutated at one point, which allowed it to begin to infect and survive in humans. So for the COVID-19 diagnostic test, First, a nose swab is collected, and this is to obtain any virus particles that might possibly be in your upper respiratory tract. The nose swab is put into a preservation solution, and then the RNA is extracted from the sample. This is commonly done with commercially available viral RNA extraction kits, and centrifugation is usually an important step in this process. The RNA is then converted into something called complementary DNA or cDNA, using a special protein called reverse transcriptase. The cDNA is combined with primers, another special protein called TAC polymerase that Claire discussed earlier, and a fluorescent probe specific to the COVID-19 DNA. These primers are based upon the COVID-19 genome and allow the scientists to test for the presence of the virus. The COVID-19 genome was discovered using next-gen sequencing in China. All these components are then loaded onto a plate and then real-time PCR is run on a machine with R&D software, of course. This then amplifies the specific region of the COVID-19 genome if the RNA is present. If the RNA is present, then after the cDNA is amplified, the probe will become so abundant that its fluorescence is picked up by the machine and the data is then analyzed and if the patient has levels of COVID-19 RNA above the negative sample threshold, they are determined to be positive for COVID-19. So right now for prevention, we have soap and water, which mechanically knocks the virus off your hands by force and by disrupting the bonds between the virus and your skin cells. We can also use hand sanitizer, which contains alcohol, which neutralizes the virus. Finally, there are many treatments in the works right now, including remdesivir, an antiviral medication, as well as vaccines um, that can be used to build immunity. And then these are our references. And then with that, that concludes the lunch and learn uh, presentation portion. Now we can move into question and answer. Hey, Ali, I got a um, pinged question that I wanted to clarify real quick. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, as far as what next gen sequencing is, it's just a fancy term basically for the new methods of sequencing. Um, basically, um, Sanger sequencing existed before this next gen sequencing, which required for every single nucleotide to be read out like a book. Kind of if you want to do your whole genome, that's th three billion letters that you're reading. Whereas um, next gen sequencing just refers to sequencing methods that um, can run sections of the DNA in parallel. So it it just all happens at the same time rather than reading it out one by one. Mm -hmm.